We're being invaded. All right. Hello, everybody. To give us a little more time, I start 60 seconds early. All right. Thanks for coming again. So we have a little bit to finish up from the last lecture. The last lecture was intense. Um, I have office hours today after class at Sydney Frank Hall. So please avail yourself of all resources in the class. Review the video, pause it, try to get caught up. So that's probably going to be the most difficult lecture. Um, today we're going to be looking at practical examples of the theoretical framework that we um, experienced in the last class. But we do need to uh, finish up bisubstrate reactions. So there's two different types of bisubstrate reactions. Um, and the way you can differentiate them is by understanding the concept of a ternary complex. So a ternary complex, so it's bisubstrate, right? So there's two substrates. Uh, a ternary complex is when both substrates are bound to the enzyme at the same time. Whereas in this other mechanism of a bisubstrate reaction, both substrates are not bound to the enzyme at the same time. So there's two different types of ternary complex, including mechanisms, the random order and the ordered uh, uh, mechanism. And so either of these things come on in sequence in an ordered way, or they can come on in either order. But in both cases, uh, you have a, what's called this ternary complex. And once both substrates are bound to the enzyme, um, only then and only then can they be converted to products. The other mechanism uh, has no ternary complex. And in this mechanism, the enzyme is oscillating between two states. Um, schematically represented here is E and E prime. So the first uh, substrate binds to the enzyme. That substrate, while bound to the enzyme, is converted to product. But the, the conversion of that substrate to product alters the enzyme in some way. So we'll see uh, examples of this type of mechanism throughout the class. Then that first product is released. The altered enzyme then and only then can bind the second substrate. While bound to the altered enzyme, that second substrate is converted to product. And so this is a mechanism. And associated with it is a configuration of these uh, double reciprocal plots that we saw before. So this is a little similar to what we looked at with inhibition, right? So with inhibition, we did line weaver burt plots at increasing inhibitor concentration. Here, we're going to do a similar thing, but instead of increasing an inhibitor, we're going to increase one of the substrates. So this is, these are the things that differentiate these two classes of uh, bisubstrate reactions, OK? And so uh, here we have, uh, we're increasing substrate 2. So playing the role of Mr. Inhibitor today is substrate 2. And then we're doing a titration of the amount of substrate 1. And so we're asking, how does the slope of this line change uh, as uh, S2 increases as a function of the first substrate concentration? And you can see that the slope of the line decreases. So remember these intercepts. It's important that you remember what those are. So this is double reciprocal plot. So this is 1 over Vmax as the uh, y-intercept. The x-intercept is negative 1 over Km. So in this type of reaction, people uh, figured out that this type of plot arises from this type of reaction. So what's happening to Vmax here? increasing. Do you see that? Because 1 over Vmax is decreasing. What about Km? So negative 1 over K, it's a little hard to see. Negative 1 over Km is increasing, so Km is decreasing. So people figured this out because they were able to study in depth certain enzymes and know what kind of mechanisms they had collect this type of kinetic data, and then they saw this type of plot. But you might wonder, why does Vmax and Km go in these directions that were observed? And although we don't know for sure, this is a logical hypothesis of why this might be occurring. 
And so increasing the, the second substrate concentration increases the rate of production of product because both products must bind to the enzyme to have productive product formation. Does that make, that makes a bit of sense. And then what about this one? Well, if you increase the second substrate concentration, uh, it decreases the amount of S1 necessary to make the ternary complex, the productive ternary complex, right? So it decreases the concentration of S1 necessary to achieve the half maximal rate because the equilibrium is already favoring uh, the formation of these two necessary steps, right? So if we um, decrease the concentration of the substrate necessary to fill half the binding sites, that, de that decreases the, uh, the KM. Hi. Yes. It's not inhibition. That's a very good question. So this is in some sense the exact inversion of inhibition. So in a bisubstrate reaction, um, two substrates need to interact with the, each other. And the only productive outcome comes when both substrates are, are being transformed, or in this case, directly into interacting. So it's sort of similar. And one, another way you can look at these plots is compare this to uh, one of the modes of inhibition and think about why is there similarities, okay? But I find that analysis more confusing than just providing a rational, out of the blue explanation. Okay. So the other one's a little bit more confusing to rationalize, but this is the pattern of data seen. So in the ping pong mechanism, remember we're oscillating between two states of the enzyme. So as we increase the concentration of one substrate, What's happening to Vmax here? So 1 over Vmax is decreasing, so Vmax is increasing, just like we saw for the last one. But what about the Km? So negative 1 over Km is decreasing, so Km is increasing? Wouldn't that be bad? So this is the pattern you see with that type of reaction. And these are reasonable explanations. It has to do with this oscillation of the enzyme between two states. If you increase substrate 2 concentration, you increase the amount of enzyme that is in this not modified state, right? Because you drive this reaction forward, okay? So increasing S2 increases the rate that the enzyme oscillates between its two forms, increasing the abundance of the form of the enzyme that can convert substrate 1 to product. But if you increase the amount of enzyme uh, that is in this form, well, there'll be more enzyme necessary to fill half the binding sites. Okay? Makes a certain amount of sense. Is this ex uh, a law of biochemistry? No, it's rational and logical. This is the data that you see, and this perhaps is the reason why um, you see these patterns. So bisubstrate uh, reactions, as mentioned, are akin to the inverse. So what is this similar to, in just in terms of pattern when compared to inhibition? So where do we see a similar pattern? Do you remember? That was a long lecture. <laughs> no guilt if you don't remember. Yeah? Exactly. Why it has a similar pattern, when you think about the mechanism, I cannot come up with a reasonable explanation. But this seems reasonable. You increase one substrate, the thing is going to be more efficiently oscillating between its forms. It's going to be able to pump out widgets more quickly. There will be more of the form here uh, that can bind that substrate. So if there's more of that form, you're going to need a higher concentration of that substrate to fill half the sites because there's more there. Okay. You with me so far? So that's the last painful bit of that lecture. But today we're going to be thinking pragmatically, okay, what does this mean for some case studies of enzymes? What are the magic forces that enzymes are employing to provide uh, the spectacular rate enhancements we've seen? So we'll be thinking about the transition state, making more bonds to the transition states than the ground state. We'll be looking, coming back to this idea of cofactors um, we, we looked at prosthetic groups, and here we're going to be looking at coenzymes, okay? And then we'll think in an abstract way, okay, what are some theoretical reasons 
why enzymes might accelerate rates of chemical reactions. And then we're going to go in depth, electron by electron, through chymotrypsin. And you might think we could literally spend, you know, probably many years of biochemistry uh, lectures going through every single detail of what's known about every enzyme. But here we're just going to get one taste of this, what's going on. And you can uh, perhaps, when you encounter different uh, enzymes, be able to understand them a little deeper. So we're going to be looking at chymotrypsin. And then we're going to look at the ways in which enzymes harness the awesome uh, catalytic uh, improvements uh, that you have for chemical reactions. You do not want to unleash a grains, uh, earth, grains of sand worth of rate enhancement willy-nilly. It's an awesome power. And so there's lots of ways that have evolved to regulate enzymes. Okay, so here's Mr. Grains of Sand on Earth. So 10 to the 17-fold faster in the presence of the enzyme than in its absence. So what in the world? Surely it's not just one thing that this enzyme is doing to provide 10 to the 17-fold rate enhancement. What could be the, uh, some of the things that enzymes are doing? Well, here's a picture of an enzyme. So we just talked about bisubstrate reactions. So here we have an enzyme um, that's catalyzing a bisubstrate reaction. And here are the two substrates in red and yellow. And the enzyme's surface is highlighted in blue color. Do you see how these two substrates are held very precisely in relation to each other? They're literally being aimed at each other. In some enzymatic reactions, it's beneficial to encompass um, the reacting substances to prevent access from the environment. And so in this case, it's a pretty deep binding group. We have these two molecules being associated. The entropy is being dramatically decreased. So out here in solution, these substrates are floating around. Um, but here, um, we've limited that, limited that entropy and it made it more likely that these two molecules would react together. So Besides, you know, the number of bonds to the transition state and the ground state, there's the control of entropy, the beautiful control of entropy that's going on here. So here's another way to look at this. So here we have stickase, right? So stickase takes stick. This is a chemical reaction. Stick gets bent, and then it reaches the breaking point. When it's really on the edge, there's an equal probability that it would go back to uh, not broken stick compared to going to broken stick. So this stick uh, reaction has a certain thermodynamic barrier. You can feel it. It takes muscles to bend the stick. But this is actually a metal stick, so you'd have to be Arnold Schwarzenegger to bend it. And here we have stickase enzyme that has magnets. And so this particular enzyme has high complementarity to the substrate. There's a lot of magnetic bonds between the substrate and stickase. And the result of that is something that I described in words yesterday, but I didn't show you a picture. Here's a picture. If you have lots of bonds to this substrate in stickase, um, the, you have great stabilization of that molecule. Okay, and do you see how this is counterproductive? So we started from a situation where the height of the uh, energy barrier was this high, and now it's actually even higher because we bound so tightly to Mr. Stick. So we're not, that this would, if you use the Arrhenius uh, equation to calculate the rate, well, EA would be larger. That would not be productive. But really what enzymes, many enzymes are doing is they make some bonds, they make enough bonds to their substrate to find it with specificity, but they make more bonds to the transition state, the stressed uh, configuration of the molecule. And this lowers the free energy of the transition state more than the ground state. And so the activation energy is decreased, delta G double dagger. Okay? So there is no stickase, but it's a reasonable way to think about things. Okay. And here's the Arrhenius equation. We've already covered this. There's a direct exponential relationship between the activation barrier and the rate of the reaction. Right? And so as the activation barrier gets larger, the rate goes down. As it gets smaller, the rate goes up. It's inversely related. Okay, so this is important. This is the magic. We're not manipulating the equilibrium with these enzymes. The free energy of the ground state of the substrate and product is the same. 
the presence or absence of an enzyme. We're just decreasing the free energy of the transition state. Okay. So you might say, well, that's a nice picture of stickase. It seems like you just made that stuff up. Is there any experimental evidence for the stickase phenomena? And it turns out that there is. Creative chemists um, uh, developed something called a catalytic antibody. And so uh, there's, there's a type of molecule called a transition state analog. Now, chemists could not synthesize a transition state and have it persist, right, because by definition, it's unstable. Um, but a transition state analog looks geometrically and in terms of charge distribution very similar to a transition state of a molecule, um, but it's more stable. And so you can use that transition state analog to uh, immunize animals and have them produce antibodies that bind very tightly to those transition state analogs. And then um, you can go and put some substrate in with that antibody and see, does the tight binding of that antibody to the transition state provide a rate enhancement? Now, nature is very good at this. Chemists, you know, they're pretty good. You have to guess what the transition state is. And, you know, sometimes uh, that's controversial. But they, they have been able to synthesize antibodies. They bind very tightly to the transition state. And they found that those um, did uh, accelerate the rate. Nowhere near 10 uh, billion fold like we'll see today for chymotrypsin or 10 to the 17 fold. We're nowhere that, that good. But it's a proof of principle that if you make more bonds to transition state than the ground state, you're going to help to accelerate the rate. But is that enough to get to 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 17? Just bonds to transition state? No, it's not sufficient. We need more. So here's a picture. If you don't believe me still, here's a picture of the reaction. The reactants here are bound to the, um, to the antibody molecule and the rate of this reaction was accelerated. Now, this is important. So if you want to develop a drug um, to inhibit a particular enzyme, you're going to want that to make the structure of that drug more similar to the transition state than the ground state of the substrate of the product, right? Because you want to make more, if you want it to be a competitive inhibitor and bind at the active site, you're going to want to have lots of bonds um, to that drug or that inhibitor. So this is important as we develop pharmaceuticals. So enzymes come in all kinds of different classes. By definition, an enzyme are the set of proteins that catalyze some reaction. But um, there's a Dewey Decimal System, which you might not know what Dewey Decimal is. That's my generation. But this is a way to organize books, right? So if you go to the library and they just threw the books all over the library, you wouldn't be able to find anything. Well, so, so the same kind of thing is with enzymes. There's tens of thousands of different enzymes in a, a human cell. How are we going to organize those? How are we going to order them, right, from a, a company? Well, we need to have a Dewey Decimal System for enzymes. And this system is based on the type of chemistry each enzyme catalyzes. You have broad groups, and then you have subgroups, and you have subgroups of the subgroups. So the broad groups describe very general chemical phenomena. So things that push electrons around between uh, molecules, those are excedoreductases transfer of electrons. Transferases, so the names make sense. Exedoreductase is going to change uh, oxidation states and reduction uh, states. And transferases, well, those are going to transferase molecules or parts of molecules between each other. Hydrolases, you think of hydro, water. So water is involved in these reactions, hydrolysis reactions, hydrolyzing various chemical bonds. Lyases are not necessarily um, the most obvious name for this class of enzymes, you might have called them eliminases or additionases, right? So these are enzymes that catalyze elimination and addition reactions. Okay, those, those are called lyases. Isomerases are isomerasing uh, substrates. Ligases are making new bonds to carbon. So these are the broad families of enzymes. Within each family, we can have subfamilies. So for example, transferasing. What are you transferasing, right? So you have 2.1. Well, that's transferasing one carbon groups. 2.2, transferasing aldehydes or ketone groups. So we can organize all these enzymes based on their uh, chemical, uh, the, the chemistry that they're catalyzing. Okay. So let's come back to modes of catalysis. 
So bonding and binding energy is important. So formation of uh, hydrogen bonds, electrostatic bonds, hydrophobic interactions uh, is important uh, in sometimes making more bonds to the transition state than the ground state. Desolvation, controlling the entropy of the substrate as well as the water in the reaction. So you might think, you know, hydrolases, well, we could push those reactions forward if those active sites were more exposed because you'd have a large concentration of water available. But other types of reactions, you might want to have a closed uh, active site where you envelop the substrates. And so, uh, but you also have to always consider when you're thinking about entropy, um, the increase in entropy of the water molecules as they don't have to encase the substrates anymore. They can make interactions with other water molecules. We can precisely position, control the entropy of the substrates by aiming the reactive groups at each other. We can transfer protons to and from substrate, acid-base catalysis. We can make new covalent bonds between the enzyme and the substrate. That's called covalent catalysis. We'll see an example of that today. Metal ions, sometimes amino acids are not sufficient to provide catalysis for all types of um, chemical reactions. So for example, oxidation reduction reactions, the propensity of metal ions to change their oxidation state can be leveraged by enzymes. So enzymes can bind with their amino acids certain metal ions, and those metal ions can change oxidation state and change the oxidation state of substrate molecules. So all kinds of different modes of catalysis. So remember when we did uh, myoglobin and hemoglobin? So th those were prosthetic groups, right? So the heme group was a prosthetic group of the myoglobin and hemoglobin protein. But you can also have something called a coenzyme. And these, unfortunately, I cannot give you a precise definition that differentiates a coenzyme from a prosthetic group. A prosthetic group binds more tightly to the enzyme than a coenzyme. But both of them are functionally the same. They're providing some lacking chemical capability um, that's not uh, provided by the amino acids in the enzyme. So when we have a uh, polypeptide, that's called the apoenzyme, and if the polypeptide needs one of these helper groups, um, when you add the helper group, either a prosthetic group or a coenzyme, uh, to the amino acid only uh, polypeptide, that's now called the holoenzyme, or the whole enzyme is the way to remember this. It's only not, it's not a whole enzyme without those extra groups. Okay, so this is just semantic definition so far. We need to talk about this. So, Art, um, one question about uh, binding in the transition state. Uh, does the enzyme form bonds to the intermediate state after orienting the substrate toward each other? Right, so intermediate state is a bit of a vague term, so that's more thought of as a a stable intermediate, um, yes, the enzyme is, the idea is that you want to provide more bonds to the transition state than the substrate in its ground state, product in its ground state, or for more complex reactions, intermediate states. So, okay. Any other questions? Okay. It gets better. We'll get out of definition land in a moment. So. You might have heard of vitamins. Vitamins are typically things that we cannot produce, that we get from our environment. Evolution has said, why do you have to make it? It's, you just eat some plants, you know, or some Cheerios, right? And so here, vitamins are uh, coenzymes in many cases. So vitamins get converted in your body to forms of molecules that are useful to help in uh, catalysis. So for example, biotin. Um, it can be used uh, to transfer groups, uh, CO2 groups, between molecules. Um, coenzyme A is good for transferring acyl groups and so forth. So these things are uh, non-amino acid molecules that are providing useful capabilities uh, to the enzyme, and we call them prosthetic groups for this group. Okay. So these are the metal ions, the ones with the green dot can uh, change their oxidation states. So those could be used in oxidation reduction reaction. Metal ions are also can be used uh, to hold a substrate precisely. So uh, magnesium, for example, has a propensity to bind an important molecule called ATP, we'll learn in this class. And it holds that ATP molecule so that it's optimally positioned uh, to transfer phosphate uh, to a substrate, for example. 
Um, metal ions can also be involved in acid-base catalysis. So the amino acids alone uh, made of the organic elements are insufficient for this chemistry. To carry out all types of chemical reactions, we need the transition state elements, right? We need metal ions because those provide uh, efficient ways to catalyze those reactions. So let's think about, uh, in a very abstract way, how controlling the entropy of a reaction can accelerate rate. So here we have two simple molecules, an ester and an acid, right? And those can come together to make an anhydride. So that reaction requires those two reactants to find each other, orient each other in relation to, they have to have a certain orientation so that this reaction can occur, right? So the oxygen attacks carbonyl, electrons will go up and back down, right? Right? And you kick out the alcohol or the, yeah, the alcohol. And so that has a certain rate associated with it. But it makes sense entropically if they don't have to go through this struggle of finding each other. In other words, if the two reacting groups are tethered together on the same molecule, well, that's going to accelerate the rate. Right? There might be still a lot of flexibility in the case of this contrived example. There's single bonds. There's degrees of rotation. So they're not going to be reacting if the two groups are distant from each other. But they don't have to get, they're already pretty close to each other. And that provides a 100,000-fold rate enhancement just by holding the two things together. So for an enzyme catalyzing a bisubstrate reaction, just by holding those together, you're providing a huge rate enhancement. But you can do better than that. Beyond holding them together on the same molecule, you can aim the two reacting groups at each other. So here we have a conformation, conformationally restricted uh, molecule where these two reacting groups are literally aimed at each other. And you get another thousand-fold rate enhancement by the aiming of the substrates at each other. So this is one of the ways uh, enzymes are providing the magic by controlling the entropy. We think of enzymes as endergonic, exergonic, not endothermic, exothermic, because control of entropy is important for these to control the reaction rate. What is the concentration of water in water? What? <laughs> water. Undefined? I think I heard it. 55 molar. So if you want to push a reaction, you might say, okay, how do you measure that? I don't know. 55 molar. If you want to push a reaction forward and water happens to be a substrate involved in a reaction, that's pretty handy. You might want to leverage the fact that there's a very high concentration of water molecules in aqueous solutions, right? And so it depends what direction you want to go here. For example, if you want to condense, could do a condensation reaction where water is a product, what might you want to do with your substrates? If water is a product and you want to have this reaction to occur quickly, do you want to have your substrates exposed to the environment or shielded? Shielded, right? So we'll be learning about the enzymes, as it turns out, RNA uh, ribozyme, that catalyze this reaction. They literally curl up, and it's this den of condensation where these reactions occur, where the access to water is precisely controlled. Now, the inverse direction, if we're hydrolyzing a bond, we're going to want to have an exposed active site where that 55 molar concentration of water can push uh, the equilibrium forward by mass action. So here's a variety of hydrolysis reactions. We'll see all kinds throughout the sem semester. So we can hydrolyze phosphoanhydride bonds, phosphate ester bonds, carboxylate esters, acyl phosphate uh, bonds. And so these hydrolysis uh, reactions, you might want to have, you can imagine, for the enzymes that catalyze these reactions, those are going to tend to have an exposed active site where water molecule, one of the reactants in the reaction, uh, can, can uh, be at high abundance, push the reaction forward. Okay, so we have condensation reactions and hydrolysis reactions. The other way that enzymes are accelerating rate is by acid-base catalysis. What's the difference between specific and general acid-base catalysis? Do you remember? Yes, hi. Uh, I guess they use it only, only from water. Yep. So specific involves you're passing protons to or from a water molecule. And for uh, general 
uh, acid-base catalysis, you're passing protons to or from a not water molecule, some other molecule. What types of amino acids might be involved in general acid-base catalysis? The acidic and basic ones, the ones on the edge, histidine, alcohol-containing ones, you believe it? PKAs. You'll see in a moment. So we can have general base catalysis, but look at why is it helping to accelerate the rate? So look at this reaction. You have the reaction of a amide bond with an alcohol-containing uh, molecule. And that's going to make this configuration. What do we call this if, if my name were Michaelis or Minton? What might I call this? Is this highly energetic? Is this stable? Transition state? So this is a transition state. How happy is an oxygen atom with a positive charge? Not happy. It's electronegative. Okay, and so here we have a positively charged, unstable intermediate um, with this, this uh, hydrogen atom here. And so what the enzyme is doing is it's picking up that hydrogen and said, wait a minute, why don't I just move you? I'm going to pick it up here, and I'm going to put it somewhere else. Chemically, why is this helpful? So see where it's moved it? So it's picked up this hydrogen and moved it down here. What have you done in terms of organic chemistry here? You've increased the leaving group ability of this, right? So if you want to break this bond, if you protonate, does nitrogen want to be positively charged? No. That makes it unhappy. So one of the possible outcomes of that is to break that bond. And that's by moving the proton away from here, that stabilizes that bond. So you're pushing the reaction in the way that you want it to go by having amino acids uh, on the enzyme take a proton off and have other amino acids or the same amino acid put a proton on. But also, we'll see examples today where water molecules can be escorted into an enzyme active site where they can take protons on or off a substrate as well. So water molecules can use, or enzymes can use water molecules. So specific and general acid-base catalysis. You have to be passing a proton somewhere for this acid-base catalysis. Okay, so we were able to infer, thinking about this logically, well, the types of amino acids involved in acid-base catalysis are the acidic and basic ones. But you might not be aware that alcohol-containing um, amino acids can be involved in this. You might say, wow, that's counterintuitive considering their pKa. But pKa's of amino acid side chains in a protein can be manipulated uh, compared to free amino acids in solution. So we can actually drop, pull this uh, proton off this uh, alcohol. We'll see an example of that today. Okay, so acid-base catalysis is important here. So now we're going to dive in a little bit deeper and do a case study. How do we bring all these modes of catalysis together in one enzyme? To, in this case, we're going to be looking at chymotrypsin. Chymotrypsin accelerates the reaction rate one billion fold. So how does it do this? Chymotrypsin is a peptidase, or if you're younger, you say protease. It's something that bind or hydrolyzes an amide bond. And these, there's different types of peptidases. Um, they're all different proteins, and they're defined by the specificity of their cleavage. So proteases or peptidases in general cleave at certain amino acids. Okay, and so, for example, chymotrypsin cleaves C-terminally of phenylalanine, tryptophan, and tyrosine. So this C abbreviation applies to all these amino acids. So what does that mean? Does it cut the bond at the alpha carbon? Now, these are hydrolyzing amide bonds, but there's, if for every alpha carbon, there's going to be an amide bond to the right and the left. One is going towards the C-terminus, the other is going towards the N-terminus. Chymotrypsin cuts to the right, cuts C-terminal amide bond next to an alpha carbon holding a phenylalanine, tryptophan, or tyrosine side chain. Got it? Another common uh, protease used is trypsin. That cleaves C-terminally 
of basic amino acids, lysine or arginine. So there's two things that this enzyme has to do. It has to provide one billion fold rate enhancement because amide bonds are stable. They have a large activation barrier to their hydrolysis, but it also has to provide specificity. So we're going to see both, and these are separate things. Okay. Okay, so here is the uh, primary structure of chymotrypsin. It has 245 amino acids. Do you see how there's these nicks here? So this single polypeptide is synthesized initially, but that polypeptide is cut. But the pieces are held together by disulfide bonds, these cysteines, right? And so these disulfide bonds, you can see them here, they're yellow. They hold this together. So would this structure be called the quaternary or the tertiary structure? Quaternary structure is multiple polypeptides, right? It is synthesized. Initially, it's one polypeptide. Whatever structure that single polypeptide adopts would be the tertiary structure. But as soon as you get in here and start cleaving these um, amide bonds, well, that's now quaternary structure. And look at this active site. It's a hydrolysis reaction. Do you see how it's just sort of sitting on the surface of the enzyme? But there's this one pocket, you know, layer of doom. What might go in there? So this pocket has to do with the specificity of the enzyme. These peptidases are pretty amazing. They're very, they're, they have high fidelity. They only cut where they're supposed to cut, in this case, aromatic amino acids. Okay, some of the amino acids that we'll be talking about today in this enzyme are histidine 57, aspartic acid 102, and serine 195. Okay, these guys are going to be teaming up on the substrate. So this is the structure of the molecule. And here you can see a picture of what might be sitting in the layer of doom, providing specificity. So here is a general schematic of the reaction. Wakey, wakey. Okay, let me come out, come back in. Okay. So here is the reaction. So here we have serine 195. The enzyme is abstracted to be a uh, blue amoeba, right? And so it's holding B, so it's some basic amino acid, and it's, there's a serine-195, and that's exposed in the enzyme active site. And here's the reaction, it's catalyzed. So another instance of chemists being lazy. What are we missing? There's two things missing from this picture. What are they? What, what is left out? Critically efficient. Lone pairs is one. That is correct. Lone pairs are not shown here. What else is left out in terms of electron pushing? Is this a correct way to push these electrons? What would you get on an orgo exam if you drew this picture? Zero, baby. That's right. You would, we're, we're not that mean. Okay. So, the, the oxygen, you're actually going to have an alkoxide ion. Whoa. And that's going to nucleophilically attack this carbonyl carbon. The electrons kick up, go from a trigonal configuration to a tetrahedral configuration. We're going to use the fact that the mechanism of this reaction needs to have this geometric change to uh, push the reaction rate forward. And then we have collapse of the tetrahedral intermediate and eventually uh, the cleavage of this amide bond. Okay, so, but in the, this is going to first occur by making a covalent bond of half of the polypeptide molecule to the enzyme. What is the substrate of a peptidase? Is it a small molecule? It's another protein. It could be titan. It could have millions of amino acids, right? And so R2 and R1 are large things. Another good reason why this reaction occurs on the surface, right? Because you can accommodate. You just have this massive protein. Chymotrypsin docks with that. It scans along the polypeptide sequence until it finds a, a aromatic amino acid. It stops, and then it cuts. Okay. So this is this reaction. Okay. This is the enzyme active site. Some features of this active site. See how these three amino acids are collaborating together in the evil plot to catalyze this reaction. So here you have something called a hydrophobic pocket that solely provides 
selectivity of this reaction does not provide rate enhancement. And then we have something called an oxyanion hole. It's like, hmm. So we call this a catalytic triad. They're teaming up and beating up this substrate. Right? And so we have an aspartic acid tugging on a proton on histidine. Now this particular form of histidine in this enzyme has just one um, proton. Right? So aspartic acid is pulling on this proton. Histidine is becoming very upset because it just has one. It does not want to share. And so then it's so upset that this histidine is going to yank the proton off of the serine alcohol. PKA of like six? How does that work? Isn't that weird? Is PKA a constant? Do you see how it's being manipulated here? You're pulling this proton off of this histidine. It's like, dude, I need a proton, man. And it gets, so that's, you're literally, it's like a rheostat. The fact that aspartic acid is tugging on this, it's positioning the histidine precisely, pointing it at this alcohol group on the serine, and it's dialing up, right, the pKa here. This is more basic. It's basic enough to pull the proton off the alcohol. Okay, and then we also have another important thing that's providing catalysis. We have, wait, serine NH? What's the side chain of a serine amino acid? OH. Did they make a mistake here? Or what are they trying to show? So might this not be the side chain? Might this be the amino group that's attached to every amino acid? Here we have glycine. What's the side chain of glycine? Is it NH? No. This is the amino group next to the glycine. These uh, amino groups are pointing at this axi anion hole, waiting for something meaningful to happen. Okay. Here's the whole picture. Of course, um, it's almost impossible to see, and likely is difficult to see up there. Um, but the one feature you can see is there's two steps. We bind the substrate, release one product, and then after a while, we release a second product. So it's a two-step process, okay? And here is another molecule that comes in. A water molecule is important in this process. So we're going to go through this in gory detail, step by step, to help you to appreciate this rate enhancement. So the first step, well, here is the substrate, phenylalanine, tryptophan, tyrosine, whatever. Some bulky hydrophobic amino acid nestles down into that pocket, and then it can't move. It's anchored by this hydrophobic pocket. And the substrate comes in and binds in this active site. So this is an abstraction of the active site. It actually looks something like this. Okay? And if you're really clever, you'll see that this is inverted from our normal orientation. Right? C terminus to N terminus here. But here we've flipped it around. You can look at it later to see that. It's not important to what I'm saying. Why did you mention it? Observation, man. Okay, so now we've formed a complex between an enzyme and a substrate. What do we call that? If you're Michaelis Minton, the enzyme substrate complex. That's what it looks like. Before, it was just this abstract arrow going to ES. It doesn't really have any meaning. There it is. That's an enzyme substrate complex. Things, so this, uh, the substrate here is a very large molecule. It's another uh, protein. It's being uh, stabilized. This interaction between the substrate and the enzyme is stabilized um, by the placement of this large, bulky ring in this position. But there's also other positions that are um, making contact and holding on to the substrate in addition to that. So initially we bind, and now we're going to start catalyzing some reactions. So we have PKA-adjusted histidine about to uh, pull a uh, proton off a of serine making an alkoxide ion. And when that happens, we're going to have nucleophilic attack of that serine alkoxide ion on the carbonyl carbon, forming a tetrahedral intermediate. Do you see the change in geometry, trigonal planar, tetrahedral? That oxygen has shifted. Oxyionine hole, initially, when the substrate binds, is not um, precisely aligned with this carbonyl oxygen. 
but when we go through the transition state, the oxygen shifts into this hull. So only when this oxygen is in this hull can it have these stronger hydrogen bonds when the polypeptide backbone next to glycine and serine. Okay? And so why is this accelerating rate? This is one of the key concepts. Why is it accelerating rate? Can you think of it? Sometimes, yes. That's right. And so how many bonds are you making to the substrate here? Less than the number of bonds to the substrate here. This is the enzyme providing this rate enhancement by making more bonds to the transition state than the ground state configuration. What about this uh, pocket over here? Is that providing rate enhancement? The hydrophobic pocket. Why or why not in terms of number of bonds? Same number of bonds. It's not accelerating anything. It is providing substrate specificity, but it's not helping to push the reaction forward. If you just, yeah, go ahead. It's precisely held in place, right? And so you're not, what, what would you do? If you had to pull this hydrogen off, what would you make? That would be pretty weird, right? Partial double bonded nitrogen losing a proton. So there's a bit of a chemical barrier to that. So this is in the polypeptide. The, the, the representation is confusing. This is the polypeptide ba backbone. The nitrogen groups in the polypeptide backbone have a partial double bond to their neighbor. So the nitrogen is not... Um, it's first because it's not close enough. It's, right, it's not bonded to the hydrogen, so discharge? These are hydrogen bonds, yes. Right, nitrogen is not... Uh, well, when we look at the genotype, like the Twitter ion format, yep. this nitrogen is not bonded to an extra hydrogen or anything then. Do you think it would be? So that's a very good point. So free amino acid is different than amino group in an amide bond. At physiological pH, it would not be protonated. In the gas phase, it would, and that's why we can do high throughput sequencing by mass spec. But in solution, this is not protonated there. You know, it doesn't have two protons. Very good point. It's confusing because there's things abstracted here. This is the polypeptide backbone. There isn't a positive charge. Now, if it were the N-terminus, yeah, it, it would have an extra proton, right? Very, very good question. Thank you for asking. So there are also uh, two questions about specificity. Yep. Uh, is chymotrypsin specific to uh, phenylalanine, tryptophan, and tyrosine because they're chemically similar? Yep. And do most uh, uh, yes, proteases yes. work this way? Yes, and, because uh, they fit in the pocket. If you don't have something fitting in that pocket, you can imagine what types of amino acids the chymotrypsin protein might surround that pocket, right? Hydrophobic amino acids, your hydrophobic interaction. And then a follow-up to that, how can uh, peptidases be specific about which residue to cleave at? Because if you don't drop an anchor, you float away. Ooh. You can tell I'm a sailor. So it literally is the anchor. Right? So there will be contact. What these the enzymes are doing is they're scanning along polypeptide sequences. And when a, a, a bulky uh, aromatic amino acid ends up in that binding pocket, it stops. Now it might just miss. Maybe it's sort of off to the side. But the only way it's going to stop, it has to stop for the reaction to be catalyzed. You've got to hold things, right? And so the specificity is actually pretty spectacular if you, if you look at it by a mass spec. Good question. Okay. All right. So now we're going to catalyze this reaction. We're going to make the, let's see, tetrahedral intermediate. So here we have the alkoxide ion attacking the carbonyl carbon. Go to transition state where the, this negatively charged oxygen is now has more bonds to it because it sits in the oxyanion hole. It's a little harder to see it here. Here you see uh, one set of dashes, and here you see two. 
but really, if you look at the actual structure, it's a big shift, and the oxygen makes really only makes hydrogen strong hydrogen bonds when it's in this tetrahedral configuration. So this is the transition state intermediate. We're forming more bonds to that than the ground state. Next, we're going to uh, drop off half this molecule. So the, tetra the transition state is going to collapse. Remember, equal probability would go in either direction. But if it goes forward, it's going to be irreversible because we're going to break a bond. So now we have an ester linkage of half our polypeptide substrate attached to the enzyme. Okay, what do we call this? What type of catalysis is this? Drop it. It's covalent catalysis, right? We've made a covalent bond here. It didn't have to do this. There's some, like HIV protease, doesn't make a covalent bond to its substrate. It just positions water very precisely. Okay, but here, we're, because we have this uh, bond to the enzyme, we can stabilize it by this change in geometry because we necessarily go through this <laughs> intermediate. So then we have ester-linked half of polypeptide sitting on the enzyme. Obviously, if this were the end of the story, you would have to make one chymotrypsin enzyme for every peptide bond broken. So we need to break this ester linkage. And so water is uh, introduced here, and it's guided into place very precisely um, by this histidine amino acid, right? And so this histidine amino acid holds the water molecule, precisely positioning it so that it can attack here. Okay, so is this, what kind of uh, reaction is this? Is this a monosubstrate or bisubstrate reaction? What form? Ternary or ping pong? Ooh, come on. Ping pong. Sort of ternary, half ternary. Half the substrate one's attached, but if you look at the, the kinetics of this, as it turns out, it is a ping pong. Um, by substrate reaction because the enzyme has been altered. E, you're looking at E prime. E prime is half of substrate attached to enzyme. That is not the same as E because it now has an ester linkage to a polypeptide. Okay, so the, the water molecule is guided in place, right? Actually, I didn't. I, I failed to highlight the fact that we have a little bit of uh, acid uh, base catalysis going on here. So we pulled that proton off the serine it was sitting on histidine, and then we uh, can donate that back to help increase the leaving group ability of this amino group, right? Help push that reaction forward by acid-base catalysis. Would that be general or specific? Just full of questions. General, because it's a base it's not, that is not water, right? Or it's an acid that's not water. And here we have the water molecule guided into place. It's going to attack and go through a second transition state stabilized by a change in geometry. Again, tetrahedral intermediate. Amide bonds are uh, broken in the same way that ester linkages are. And so you have a tetrahedral intermediate. Electrons go up. Oxygen shifts over. You make more bonds to that than the previous state of things. Um, but now we want to help catalyze uh, breaking a bond, right? And so uh, we're going to donate, we're going to protonate this, increase its nucleofugacity, increase its leaving group ability. Um, that also dates me. Okay. And so here we have cut the ester linkage, right? Half the water molecule ended up here, the other half ended up here. And so now we have a EP, right? Is the enzyme product complex, and the only last step is release of the product, regenerating the enzyme, allowing it to be processive. Okay? So this is chymotrypsin. This is the mechanism of action. Let's recap. A lot of things happened while we were looking. So we saw the acylation phase. You had this uh, cleavage of the peptide bond where you made an ester linkage, a stable intermediate ester linked serine attached to half the substrate molecule. The oxyanion hull was providing rate enhancement by making more bonds to the transition state of two different reactions here than the ground states. 
Uh, and then we hydrolysis of the ester linkage. We saw some examples of general acid base catalysis by other groups in the active site. So all of these factors are culminating in a billion fold rate enhancement. Thank goodness that amide bonds are stable. All our proteins would immediately disintegrate if they weren't. But sometimes it's necessary to turn proteins over. And so we need to be able to lower this barrier and increase the rate. And that's what this enzyme is doing. Okay, so this is recapping the structure. The three, the triad, the gang of amino acids are culminating to catalyze this reaction. Any question about chymotrypsin? No. Okay, so there was a wonderful question in last lecture about, well, wait a minute. How does pH affect KCAT and KM? And I did not provide a suitable example at that time, but actually chymotrypsin has this type of behavior. So here's chymotrypsin. As you change the pH, the KCAT is increasing, right? Something magical is happening right around pH 7. You might guess what that would be. And then at even higher pHs, KM goes from being small inversely related to the parent binding affinity, so that's strong binding, to a weaker binder. So in general, KM, uh, the effect of pH on KM, while it involves the ionization of the substrate or enzyme, might uh, affecting the tightness of binding to the substrate. So KM has this relationship to binding affinity, and when you ionize either the enzyme or the substrate, you could affect that. KK, you're talking about the maximal processivity of the enzyme the chemical transformation. So ionization of things can affect how efficiently the enzyme machine is operating, right? So ionization of key residues could affect the uh, ability of the enzyme to be in its active configuration. So can you think of what might be causing this? KCAT? So as you, say again? The y-axis is depends on whether you're talking about KCAT. So this is KCAT kilojoules, or I, I don't know what the units are, and this is KM units. So KCAT is increasing. What's causing KCAT to go up as the pH goes up? What happens right around here? pH 7. So it has to do with the chemistry. So there's something going on here. What's happening at pH 7 there? You guys asked the question, so. Do you see it? So this histidine is going to begin to become protonated. If that histidine is protonated, how good is it going to be to pull off this hydrogen atom from the alcohol? That destroys the ability to do covalent catalysis. Okay, so protonation, changing the pH state, affects the ionization state of the cystidine, making, removing one of the forms of
volume back up. Back up, 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 up. I'm going to bring it up. Okay, got it, got it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so there's experiments underlying the mechanisms that I've described to you. There's two different types of inhibition, irreversible inhibitors. Um, these uh, make uh, dead in covalent bonds with the enzyme and prevent the enzyme from ever catalyzing another reaction. And then we also have um, reversible inhibitors. So what we're going to do here uh, is we're going to use these irreversible inhibitor probes
all have triads, right? And they all have a uh, form they call they don't have bond between the serine amino acids and the substrate. This C proteases, a family of proteases called caspases, is important in apoptosis and cell death. Um, well, those form covalent bonds uh, with cysteine and the substrate, caspase proteases and metalloproteases. So all these are named according to the type of chemistry catalyzed in the enzyme exercise, not by the specificity when it comes to the uh, general family. Okay? They all, all these serine proteases use the same mechanism of action, triad. Nature said it worked before, do it again. No reason to make a change. Okay, so this is an amazing rate enhancement. 10 to the 9 fold, 1 billion fold faster. Um, and so surely once a protease is made in a ribosome, you don't want to just start cutting up proteins. It'll start to chop away at the, the proteins on the ribosome, and it'll inappropriately just cut everything up. You want that thing turned on only when it's uh, appropriate. And so we'll see how penetrin is regulated by proteolytic cleavage. It's re referred to as zyogen. You can also have reversible covalent modification as and, and allosteric modulation. So reversible covalent mod modification is also a form of allosteric modulation. We learned about allosteric modulation when we looked at hemoglobin in the case of a, a protein that binds to a ribosome. So let's consider this. So here's chymotrypsin. Initially, when synthesized by the ribosome, the single polypeptide, it's not able to achieve the uh, three-dimensional structure necessary to align the catalytic triad and to catalyze the reaction that it needs to catalyze. In order for it to achieve that orientation, you must break these bonds. So you fold it up, make some disulfide length, and then make two lengths, shift the shape of chymotrypsin, and turning it on. This is a one-way, it's not allosteric. Allosteric is, uh, is reversible. This is a one-way activation. The only way you're going to turn this off is actually to degrade the protein, and that's what this is up. Other proteases also use the strategy of activation uh, by cleavage. This is irreversible. When we have uh, the, the one type of way in which we can activate or turn off a protein is by making a modification to that protein. And these are enzymes. Each enzyme in this cascade is processive. So this one enzyme comes, turns over more than one substrate. Some enzymes have an enzymatic activity that is to make a chemical modification in another protein, causing it to turn on or turn off. So here we have an enzyme. Let's say the kinase, the type of enzyme that adds phosphate, one of these types of marks. Um, then once these enzymes are modified, by uh, phosphorylation, they're turned on, and each one of those is perceptible. So from a tiny starting point, you have a massive amplification, a large response, right? So when you turn on this signal, you just need a little bit of the environmental cue to turn it on, and then you'll have a very rapid and robust response. Here's one example of this, a uh, blood clotting cascade. Um, this is a proteolytic interall zymogen. So do you want blood clotting to go slowly? No. It will not if it goes slowly. You want this to go like this. But you don't want, I mean, this cascade involves cleavage of protein. You don't want this to happen at the wrong time. You would get clots in your blood. You would also be um, in bad shape. So when you get the right signal, when there's a cut, um, the blood clotting is initiated. And this is a zymogen cascade. One, uh, uh, cleaving the neck, cleaving the neck, leading to a rapid and robust response, the initial impulse, right? So you have blood clotting, and you can also, the resolution of the clot, the removal of the clot, involves a smaller cascade of this system. Okay, and so it's less urgent to clear the clot, you know, because you're not bleeding to death, right? And so that can be uh, less we talked about allosteric modulators. We've defined those as things that bind to the site other than the active site, changing the shape of the enzyme, either turning it off or on. So here, for example, we have an R and a C subunit of the protein, R for regulatory, C for catalytic. The regulatory subunit binds a regulator, an allosteric regulator, and that binding event changes the shape. It shifts to the right. right? And this change in the shape allows accessibility of the active 
metastasize to the substrate, where it allows the chemistry to happen. It changes the optimal orientation. And we have some definition. If the allosteric regulator, by the by other than the active side, is the same as the substrate, that's called homotropic allosteric regulation. If the regulator is a different molecule than the substrate, it's heterotropic. So remember when we looked at uh, hemoglobin, we saw both homotropic and heterotropic regulation. Oxygen is homotropic, and the rest of those guys are heterotropic regulators. Okay, so this theme is going to come throughout the class of nausea. There's a, a non-hyperbolic relationship between relaxation rate and substrate concentration for allosterically regulated processes. So can we define a KM for an allosterically regulated enzyme? Would the line weaver burp plot be linear? No, it would not. It would be close, but it would not be linear. So instead of saying KM, we say K.5. And that's defined as the substrate concentration necessary to fill half the binding site. But it's not exactly equal to the KM. We cannot use Michaelis in the traditional Michaelis in genetics to calculate it. We have to use a more uh, advanced type of uh, calculation. Uh, and I'm going to skip this. So we can have heterotrophic or homotrophic allosteric regulation that is positive or negative. In other words, the binding of the regulator can cause a more optimal configuration of your enzyme to catalyze the reaction or a less optimal uh, configuration. We can do, it does this by changing either the Vmax or the Km. So if it's a positive uh, heterotrophic uh, regulator, it shifts this curve uh, to the left, right? So that decreases uh, the number of substrate molecules necessary to achieve half maximal rate. That's positive, that's good. It shifts the curve to the right. Well, it takes a higher concentration of substrate molecules to, for the enzyme to achieve its fast maximal rate. It can also modulate the Vmax. And so if you shift up, well, it's more perceptive. If you shift down, it's less perceptive. This is all by controlling shape transitions in the enzyme. Okay. I think I'm going to come back to this because today's clicker will be the hardest of the semester. Sorry. I used to have it on an exam.
All right. You guys do you want uh, more time? You need more time? You can fill the remaining minutes with explanations or discussion amongst yourselves, either of which are good. Give it uh, 10 more seconds. For those that haven't voted, um, you either need to turn in or vote within the next not 10 seconds. You need a piece of paper. Right. We have a uh, banner ID and uh, the vote. All right. I think we're going to stop the polling, Alex. Okay, let's go through each of these answers separately. What about acid base catalysis? Why not? What's left, right? The things that are doing acid-base catalysis are mutated in this example. What about uh, transition state stabilization? Okay. <laughs> I phone like that answer. Um, okay, maybe. Covalent catalysis. That amino acid's gone. Hydrophobic effects. Are you sure? Why not? So the substrate couldn't bind without the hydrophobic pocket. Is that the question I'm asking? No. Come on. No. Tell them. So how would a hydrophobic pocket provide rate enhancement? Only if it made more bonds to the substrate ground states in the transition state. Hardest one of the semester. You made it through. You guys did really well, actually. <laughs>